Good evening, good morning, wherever you are, however you're watching, thank you so much for joining me for Wednesday Night Live. Tonight is a very important night. I know many of you are watching from outside Arizona, and hello to all of you. However, tonight is important if you live in Arizona. Our online ministry has been primarily for you. We've, we've been thinking through how to shepherd you, knowing we only have a certain amount of time each Sunday to do so. So we started this online thing with, with, uh, with, with our podcast, but then it's like, now, now church is shut down. Now we need to keep getting content to you, just to shepherd you and care for you during this time. Well, we also knew that people would look over our shoulders while we shepherd you. So while tonight people are maybe watching from all over the world, which is pretty typical now. This is, is really focused for the people of Redeemer Bible Church here in Arizona. Tonight is really gonna, it's, it's really gonna kind of feel that way. And so I just, t- tonight is gonna feel less like a sermon and more like a fireside chat. I just want to talk to you from my heart about where we've been as a church during the past 10 weeks and, and where we're headed into the future. And so we've, I just want you to know that we've thought, we've prayed, we've talked, we've received counsel, we've talked some more, we prayed some more. So what we're going to talk about tonight is what we believe is God's will for Redeemer Bible Church as he's, as he's led us as an elder team. So I hope that you sense that by the end of our time tonight, but, but I know that that takes the God of the universe helping me do that right now. So as you're sitting there, however you're watching this, please, let's pause for a second and let's pray together. Father, I, I say it often to myself. I say it often in prayer. The words of Jesus, John 15, 5, apart from him, we can do nothing. And tonight as we cast vision for the future, as tonight we recount what you have done over the past 10 weeks, Father, I know that there is so much room for misunderstanding. I know there's so much room for um, innuendo and and not believing the best and, and not choosing to trust. And I just know there's so much, there's so many pitfalls or, or potholes that I could I could step in tonight. So I pray that you would protect me from all of those. And I pray that what your will is for our church will be clear. It will be obvious to everybody watching. And that overall, there will be a general sense of, of, yes, this is what the Lord has done. And yes, this is where the Lord is taking us. So God, I know just even saying that, that that is not possible without you. So would you please guide my thoughts, guide my words, guide my tone, guide my demeanor. May everything tonight be pleasing to you. and, And may everything tonight convey your will for Redeemer Bible Church. This is your church. It belongs to you, Jesus. You are the senior pastor. We follow your direction. We, f- we want to follow your lead. And that includes the future of our church. And so would you please, please help us. Please guide me tonight, I pray, for the glory of your name. Amen. Now, on May 10th, 2015, we had a funeral for the church formerly known as Desert View Baptist Church. I didn't call it a funeral that day, but in that day that we recounted all the Lord had done over the 35 years of ministry, I was told uh, by about half a dozen consultants at the time that after that meeting, I should shut the church down for at least three months, but more likely six months. Just kill the old DNA, they said. Let the disgruntled people find another church, they said. Pray together, preach through the book of Acts, cast vision, and then after three to six months, yet yeah, then, then reopen. For reasons, uh, various reasons at the time, I, I disagreed with that counsel. I just didn't think it was God's will for us to close. So I didn't listen to any of the experts. And the very next Sunday, May 17th, 2015, we reopened as Redeemer Bible Church five years and three days ago. So we just celebrated our five-year anniversary as a church to so much fanfare on the weekend that I forgot to mention it. But uh, during these past five years, we've had a ton of challenges. And even in the most critical moments, we just kept going. For anyone who's been here for all or a good part of those five years, there's no mistaking that the wind has been at our backs when it comes to ministry here at Redeemer. We didn't, we didn't close the church then, And listen, we didn't close the church for COVID-19. 
That's why I don't talk about reopening. We're simply regathering Redeemer Bible Church because the work of the ministry, the mission of Jesus here at this church never closed. The church is not a building. The church is a movement that exists to help people come to know, love, and serve Jesus. And that hasn't stopped happening here during these past 10 weeks. Home Depot started limiting uh, people to uh, 150 people in their stores. And if we did something like that, we'd need a dozen services every weekend. So we decided to suspend our services one Sunday after most churches did so here in Arizona. We took some heat for that, for meeting in person one Sunday longer, but we wanted to show a, a sense of strength in the midst of fear when the threat was very minimal at that time. Half of you didn't even show up that Sunday, which told us, okay, something is going on. We suspended our services the next Sunday because of the, the actions and the recommendations of our president and our governor, and we took heat for that too. So getting fired at from both sides is kind of fun. Hasn't stopped, but that's okay. There's nothing sinful about making those decisions. We are a part of a long line of churches who pivoted their ministries in the wake of pandemics, the most recent being churches 102 years ago because of the flu when the government asked them to do much the same thing that the government has asked us to do. We did not forsake assembling together. That happens when gatherings are going on and people make it a habit not to come even though those gatherings are going on. That means that many Christians forsake the assembling all the time because it's their habit to only come to church once or twice a month. Churches were never required by law to stop holding services in Arizona. That might be true in other states, but that hasn't been true here, thank God. A handful of mostly smaller churches decided to keep meeting, but we joined the, the majority of pastors in Arizona who, who stopped meeting. And we did that out of love for our neighbors and listen, we did that out of love for you. We couldn't imagine some of you trusting us as your shepherds to take care of you and those you love, only to have someone here get the virus when we could have easily prevented it from happening. You might scoff at thinking, oh, that's so unlikely. But one member who serves in our kids' ministry got the virus. And a church that's not far from us that, that kept meeting exposed their entire congregation to the virus when somebody showed up who ended up having it. We, were, we, we are, as pastors, charged to lead, to feed, to care for and protect the people that God has entrusted to our care. So suspending services came from a desire to do that, to, to do just that, knowing that a small percentage of you would disagree with us for doing that. We decided a handful of disagreeing people was far better than doing funerals. And so that's what we did, which, has, which was how things were presented, if you remember, early on in this pandemic. I have pastor friends across the country who have done funerals because of this pandemic, or they are going to do funerals once, once people can gather again because of this pandemic. And we didn't want any of that for you. Now, as to the message of, of tonight, let me say this. My goal in the first message that I gave on this subject is the same goal that I have right now. We need to think about what's going on biblically so that we, we respond well to this stage of the pandemic. And in order to do that, I think we need to start back where we, we started, back in, in Titus chapter 3, with the issue of our response to the government. Nothing the elders have done have been about politics. The vast majority of you know that. You've been consistent examples of trusting the Lord and obeying Hebrews 13, 17 to follow your leaders. And we appreciate you for that. We thank you for that. You making our lives, our ministries easy, making it, making it well, that, that is a blessing from God through you to us. And we can't thank you enough for that. Your trust has been incredibly appreciated. All Christians, each and every one of us, have the same biblical obligation to their governments. We're not weak. We aren't tricked into obeying the government when we obey the government. It's not weakness to do so. An obligation, hear me, means command. 
non-negotiable directives from the God of the universe for how we act as Christians who are also Americans. It is never weak, it is always strong to obey what the Bible says. In summary, you and I are obligated to obey your government, period. It does not matter if we like it, it doesn't matter if we agree with it, it doesn't matter if we think it's better somewhere else than it is here. God commands you and me to obey the government. Even when Nero was Caesar, Peter wrote 1 Peter chapter 2 to Christians telling them to submit to him. And it's not just Romans 13. It's Titus chapter 3. It's 1 Peter chapter 2. Four commands in the New Testament to obey the government. God really only needs to say it how many times? He only needs to say it once. He repeats it four times so that you and I get it that we are to obey the government. Jesus showed this when he submitted to wicked authorities when he was executed. So I said when I preached for Titus chapter 3 verse 1 that we're going to obey the government, but we do not obey the government. What did I say? Do you remember? We do not obey the government unconditionally. Only God gets that. Daniel chapter 3, Daniel chapter 6, Acts chapters 4 and 5 all show this. Make it clear, civil disobedience for the Christian, however does not mean we must obey the Constitution rather than man. Civil disobedience for the Christian means we must obey God rather than man. The Bible doesn't teach absolute blind obedience to the government. We should never ever obey the government when it tries to take the place of God. God delegates authority to people, to organizations, to churches, to government, but he delegates absolute authority to nobody. When the government forbids what God commands or commands what God forbids, we are to obey God rather than man as an act of worship to that God, to our God. Now, the $64,000 question is, is that what Governor Ducey's been doing to us? Has he been demanding us to choose him or God? I'm not talking about other states or other countries. I'm talking about ours, Arizona. Has Governor Ducey commanded what God forbids or forbidden what God commands? I don't think any reasonable person would say that he has. We were told to stop meeting because Christianity was now against the law. The government didn't tell us to stop worshiping. It didn't tell us to stop preaching God's word. It didn't tell us to stop spreading the gospel or ministering to the people around us. We've not been fined because of our religious convictions. If so, we would obey God rather than man and we would meet. The law was applied to all large gatherings of people equally. And Costco or Walmart, by the way, is not equivalent to a high school football or basketball game or a concert. The duration of, the, of this restriction to assemble was temporary. The motive of the restriction was not anti-Christian, but it was the public good. And the extent of the restriction was broadly applied. It, it was not targeting Christians. Arizona has not persecuted Christians. It has not arrayed itself against the church as the enemy. The government told all of us to behave differently so that people wouldn't die. Do you remember that? That's what it was. For families, that meant one thing. And for churches, that meant not meeting for now. Governor Ducey always called the church essential. He always did. Go look. Our decision to suspend gatherings was not because we were told to do so under legal penalty. It, 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 it was motivated, it's Proverbs 22, 1, caring about our reputation among non-Christians. It's Matthew 22, loving our neighbors. And it's John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, showing love for you, the way that Jesus loves you. So we've seen it in Titus, our good works adorn, our good works add beauty to the gospel. So our decision was to be good citizens, to love our neighbors, to love all of you. Meeting when everyone else was asked not to for public safely might make you feel good about yourself, but it doesn't beautify the gospel. We are to live quiet and peaceful lives, 1 Timothy 2.22, which is the result of our support of those who are in authority over us in the government. So we're to give our government our obedience, but not our worship. 
That's idolatry. And if that was ever demanded here, if the government doesn't give back the temporary power it's been given in this crisis, we will be the first to encourage you to obey God rather than men and even go to jail if we have to. Now, I needed to say that because as a family fireside chat, we see the disruptions going on amongst you. We hear it. We see it. And we need to care for you. We need to shepherd you in that. We love you. We don't want you to go into an area of disobedience on this issue and then, and then post something and, and, get up and try to influence people in that direction. That's sinful. That's wrong. And so as your shepherds were coming to you, pleading with you, going, no, remember, the, remember what the Bible says about the Christian's responsibility in a non-Christian world. It is to obey the government. And by doing that, you show the world how great a God that you have. And so we ask you to do that. We ask you to continue to support the government in your heart, in your conversations, and especially on social media. Continue, please, to support our government. Now, in a state of the church address, it's, a, it's important for you to know what's been going on during this crazy time at our church. And so Kyle, come on up here. Kyle is one of, the, one of our pastors. He's led the effort to shepherd you during this time. So aside from Redeemer Live, Wednesday Night Live, The Daily Word, Redeeming Truth, Pastoral Prayer, Redeemer Cares, getting your growth groups connected and continuing on Zoom, ministry has continued here. So Kyle, come on up and, and tell us more about this. So I have some questions for you. So specifically, how has ministry continued at our church, through our church during this time? Yeah, well, it's really been amazing to see because, you know, even in disrupting our normal routine, we've seen our people, uh, members of our church, attenders of our church adapt and, and really find those avenues to serve each other, minister to each other, reach out to one another. Uh, and we've seen that happen in multiple ways. Uh, but there, there's so much going on with people concerned about one another, caring for one another, growth groups reaching out to one another, individuals contacting the church, asking how they can serve, uh, how they can uh, participate in uh, what we created here, the, the uh, food pantry, uh, donating to that, asking about uh, transporting food or goods to people who need them. Um, caring for each other, praying for each other. A team of us have been calling around to everyone who's on our member roles and our attender roles just to reach out and make sure people are feeling connected. That's great. Is there something that stands out from the phone calls that, that particularly helps us, helps us understand how people have been responding to the church? Yeah, well, I think in general, from those phone calls, we've seen people just be very grateful for that touch because, mm -hmm. yes, people have been feeling isolated. So in this time when we're, we're stuck at home, there, there's more time kind of just on our couch or in our home office or in the kitchen, whatever it may be, not having that option to go out and, and fellowship with each other. Those touches, those, those member calls, people's just saying, hey, thank you for calling and reaching out, just checking in that we're doing okay. Here's how you can pray for me. And, and you really see that relational bond grow even at a distance. That's great. So our goal was to contact every member and every attender that we had, we had people's information for, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's we had uh, 2,800 people, I think 2,900 people in our database. Now it was good. It was, it was kind of a cleansing effort in a way because we had a lot of people who said, hey, thanks for the call. Uh, I'm not really going there anymore. So that's okay. We were able to concentrate our efforts back to our, our members and the people who are here currently. That's great. So if somebody needs help with the basics, do we have a way to help them? We do. As always, contact info at redeemeraz.org. We would love to come alongside you and serve you in whatever way we can. Uh, we have resources available. Uh, you know, Just depending on what your needs are, we'd, we'd love to have you spell those out for us. And we'll do our best to meet those needs, whether they be food or material goods or uh, financial in, in some way if we can. We'd love to come alongside you and serve. We know that we're getting towards the end end of the pandemic, but the, uh, the financial ramifications, those, uh, those economic ramifications are going to be there for a while. So. so if somebody wants to help and they're mm -hmm. watching right now, how would they do that? Yeah, in the very same way, info at redeemeraz.org, just let us know that you want to get involved in serve and and uh, we, we've had many of you reach out and we've tried to get as much as, as many of you involved as we can in different ways. Uh, but if you reach out and just let us know what you're what you're capable of doing, what 
your, your able, what kind of time frames you're able to give and, and what, what, how you're able to serve, we would love to uh, put you in, in the, right, uh, the right camp, the right category there and, and get you mobilized. So finally, anything else that you'd like to say to the people of Redeemer? Yeah, I would just like to say it's been, it's been so amazing and such a blessing watching during this season where we've really just kind of been thrown uh, you know, for a loop for the last few months. Uh, everybody adapt and, and jump in and say, how can I serve? And, and I'm sure there's been those who have, who have also felt the pressures and the burdens of, of the pandemic. And we've been praying for you and we've been, we've been lifting you up as pastors. But for the most part, I, I've seen so many people get involved and want to serve. And I, I think even thrown out of our comfort zone, there's been given an opportunity for people to think differently and say, you know what, this is my church and I want to own it and I want to engage and I want to give whatever gifts I have to serve. So thank you to all of you who've been doing that. We're so grateful. It's such a blessing to see. Right on. Thank you, Kyle. Yep. Because of your generosity, as I've been saying before, you, you make it possible for us to help the many people that have reached out to us. And one of the things I learned from the survey that I asked all of you to fill out is that 30% of the people that filled out that survey had some kind of job change because of this pandemic. And so you've been able, for those who've reached out to us, you've been able to help them. And I can't thank you enough for your generosity at this time. Now, um, because we've been, we haven't been meeting, there's a whole nother aspect of the work going on here that I want Dale to come up and talk about. And so Dale, come on, come on over. He's still recovering from back surgery. So please continue praying for him, okay? So now we, Thank you. we haven't been meeting for the past 10 Sundays. The staff has been super busy though recently. And so can you briefly overview what's, what's been going on? Yeah, when this, uh, when this pandemic hit, we, we did not know how to do church the way we're doing it now. Right, so we, as a team, had to, on the fly, figure out how to present our services in a digital uh, way. And um, we, I think our team came together really well. I'm proud of our team, and uh, we, we worked very hard. I would actually say we're working harder now than we probably were before, and we were working hard then. Uh, we've been committed, as a team, to to not only continue to care for our people, but to get the word out to our people. And there's been a, um, what I would consider a, an unexpected benefit of that is that the preaching of the word has gone even further than Gilbert, which has been exciting. It's been incredible. Yeah, we took our staff and we, we said, you're gonna be in the content bucket or the care bucket. That's right. And then we just kept moving ministry That's right. forward. And so um, is there anybody in particular that, that helped us in that online shift that, that you want to recognize? Absolutely. So um, our, our, I don't even know his title right now, but his technical, our technical director, Daniel Dorsmith, has really, has, he, is, he has yeah. been amazing. And Absolutely. the people here at Redeemer Bible Church, um, please continue to pray for him and his wife and his, his young son. And uh, the, the amount of effort, the amount of skill, the amount of um, just care and concern that Daniel has put into the effort in the last two and a half months has been an answer to prayer. And we, we just owe him our gratitude. We owe him a big thank you. Absolutely. And we, we just need to pray for him continually because yeah, he, he might collapse after this. Absolutely. So we need yeah, to need pray against that, right? For sure. And <laughs> even on our staff, we made a new hire during this time. We did. So we, so we had a conversation when this first happened as, as leaders that there's, there's three potential ways to respond to something like this. One is to kind of stand pat, just kind of batten down the hatches and just see what comes. Yeah. The other was to actually take a, take a reverse measure and just kind of you know, walk back a little bit and then kind of see the lay right. of the land. And then there was the other option of, you know, this is, see it for the opportunity that it is. And I don't mean that in any other way except for spiritually speaking, mm -hmm looking out into the fields and seeing that the, the fields are ripe for harvest. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people through this pandemic um, have revealed fear. A lot of people have revealed um, hopelessness. And I think as churches look to advance and reach those people, um, we have found this. People have gotten saved mm -hmm. in the last two and a half 
months of us doing this, people in Hawaii, people across the United States, contacting Redeemer Bible Church, this little tiny church in Gilbert, Arizona, right. and they're coming to faith. Right. So um, I, that's where I, I say I'm really proud of our team because we came together, we learned how to do church in a different way. We never stopped. You said this in your opening. We never closed. We, yeah. we, we continue to do ministry and focus on the mission that God gave us and yeah. people are still coming to faith and we're going to continue to do that. Yeah. And so we know that loving our neighbors is not just um, keeping them from getting infected from a, from a virus, but it was also helping people in our community who are suffering. And so, so you had the idea, hey, let's, let's, let's pick a restaurant and just send all of our people to that restaurant once a week. And yeah. so, our Redeemer Cares initiative has been just a huge blessing to our local community here. Yeah. Um, I think we're on our fifth restaurant now and uh, maybe fourth, fourth, yeah. fourth restaurant now. And uh, every single time the feedback we've gotten is the people of Redeemer has, they've just blown the socks off of the local yeah. restaurant owners and, and uh, staff. But that idea was specifically so that we have a, you know, we know, love, serve, right? That's mm-hmm. Redeemer Bible Church. Mm-hmm. And we also are centered on Jesus. We're focused on people. Mm-hmm. So the centering on Christ part, the centering on Jesus part is the teaching of the word. We're, mm-hmm. we're going to put Jesus out there. Mm-hmm. The focus on people is practically the application, like you're an applicational preacher, mm-hmm. taking the word of God and applying it to our daily lives. Mm-hmm. And one way to do that, to love our neighbors was let's, as we're able, let's support our neighbors yeah. and provide them some business. Yeah, so it was restaurants, which helped the restaurant owners, which helped the staff, the employees, That's right. that filters out to everything that they touch That's right. in our community. We can't, we, can't, we can't do everything, but we can do our little part to help right. people. Right. And so is there anything else you'd like to say to our, our people. Yeah, I, I would, again, I would just want to reiterate um, how thankful I am for each and every member of this team. You mentioned we have a new pastor. Pastor Daryl has joined our team in this and to know that we're able to, we're gonna be able to focus on a segment of people that I know you and I care deeply about. Um, uh, people who are coming to Arizona, as you say, to live out their last years. Yeah. And as, as people ignore them, um, for the most part, we're going to focus on them. So I, my last, the last thing I would say is just please join us in praying for that and supporting that, supporting Pastor Daryl. When we're all back together, make sure you say hello to him and welcome him to our church. Absolutely. Well, thank you for that, Thank Dale, you very much. And also, because we haven't met for the, pan, the past 10 weeks, we've, uh, we've finished some projects around here that we budgeted to accomplish for the whole year of 2020, and we've been able to f- complete them all now. And so when we regather, you are going to be very pleased with, with how we redeemed the time around here on our campus. So uh, now, back in late March, early April, we started saying that when it, when it comes to our church, the thing that we're most afraid of was not the virus. And it wasn't the government either. The thing that we were most afraid of was disunity over how and when we should regather. And it's safe to say that our fears were justified. And so Costi, you, you wrote about Christians using their opinions about the government to, and regathering against each other. And so come talk to us about this for a little bit. Yeah. So you, you wrote an article that, that went kind of viral about this subject. And uh, what, what alarmed you? that caused you to say, I need to write this. Yeah, the, the polarization on the topic, which any, anybody knows if we're gonna talk about Bible and what's in the text, and you do this all the time, is we're gonna be polarizing. If the Bible says it, we're going with the Bible. So That's it doesn't right. matter if culture's all the way over here, we're here. But there are a lot of things in life that are not wise to take a polarizing position on. This being yeah. one of them, you see a lot of stone throwing, and there was the group that said, you know, we're, you're, we're not going to roll over on the government here. You know, we're going to take our stand, and this is America, and it's the Constitution, and we have the freedom. And, and they, were af- they were talking about our rights, and, and they're right. There are some truths there, and most polarizing positions have a little bit of truth Absolutely. on each side. Yep. And then on the other side, the polarizing side of, you know, they're dying in the streets. It's the Black Plague. Uh, you know, if, if you even walk by someone and you don't wear a mask and have a hazmat suit, we're all going to die. So you have fear and then maybe fury. That would be like the two sides. Yeah. So I started seeing it. We talked, our yeah. whole team talked. And yeah. I, I thought, you know, we need to write just 
something or maybe put something together that people can utilize and pastors can utilize. And so that was the heart of the article was yeah. just thinking, you know, maybe don't sling stones. This is going to be a rough ride for all of us. We need yeah. to pray and bond together. Amen. So how does social media contribute to what you were concerned with? Oh, it, it's snowball. Hmm. Like I grew up in Canada. I know we don't do snow in Arizona unless you <laughs> yeah. go north. I know in Flagstaff and Pine Top. But, right. you know, your snowball goes and then you start rolling it and it builds on itself. Well, you get one person that drops an article and they're furious and that gets tweeted and shared and Instagrammed and argued. And then, of course, with Twitter, it's a lot of debating and short ideas. And yeah. so there's not a lot of context. That grows, but then you see real churches and pastors getting affected, right. guys going to war, and, and it really can compound. And I would go further, that then can carry over into the real church, meaning not online, where yeah. people get fired up online, then they go call you or they send me an email and they go, hey, I was talking to so-and-so. Really, they were tweet arguing. Right, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, you need to do this, and, right. you, and you better, th and you're going, where's all this coming from? You go online, it's a war zone. Yeah. Yeah, the Facebook warriors. Yep. that aren't helpful. They talk about people. They don't talk to people. And uh, let me add one element. Yeah, you, yeah. you reminded me. Yeah. The, the online gossip is where, so this is like the new era of church. In the yeah. old days, you just had, you know, Sally and, and Janice in the corner and Bob right. and Joey over here and they're talking. You go, hey guys, let's take it easy. And it, yeah, yeah. Now online, people are throwing stones, dropping names, you know, passive aggressive is a big one. And none yeah. of that is helpful. Yeah. Even if there's some truth, to it. It's not helpful. It's actually more hurtful. So Absolutely. we need to address it. So is there, is there a problem with different kinds of people with different kinds of opinions? Not at all. In fact, we need to agree that we are going to be different. And actually we should practice saying it's okay to be different. You know, you in your living room, wherever <laughs> you are, okay. you should say that out loud. Like it's okay to be different in some wild churches. You know, they go turn to your neighbor, touch them on the right. shoulder, no social distancing. <laughs> Tell your, tell your neighbor, it's okay to be different, everybody. It's okay Amen. to be different. That's right. It's okay to be different. We're going to be different, yeah. period. That's true. And so with all those differences, you, I think your article talked about the cautious and the confident and those in between. How easy is it for pastors to plan like something like regathering with all those people in mind? Yeah, piece of cake. I don't know what took you so <laughs> yeah, long. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's hard. It's yeah. really hard. You, you mentioned it. You got the confident, the cautious, and then I call them the cautiodent. Yeah. You know, it's like a little bit of both. It is really hard for pastors to plan. We're human, and I don't care how many doctoral degrees you have or how many master's degrees or Pastor Kyle has like six different degrees. I, it does not matter how educated yeah. you are. There is no seminary course on pandemic and strategy and angry people and politics and all, all in one. So it's really, it's difficult and we seek the Lord for James 1, 5 wisdom. So you said in that article that there were some attitudes that, that were more helpful during this phase. And mm. so what, what were some of those? Lots of grace, waves of it, uh, buckets of it, and then choosing to love. If we choose relationship, that will always be helpful because let's, let's take the argument, right, in debate theory. Let's just take an argument to its logical conclusion. It's all conspiracy. China tried to crash our economy. The whole thing is fake news except a few people got a virus. Okay, take that all the way it's to logical conclusion. What good does arguing do? What good does being rude or nasty? No, we still got to come back to 950 North Greenfield and sit together and take the Lord's table together. Right. What good does I told you so do? And then on the other side, let's say everybody starts getting really sick and this thing blows up again and now we got to shut down. What good does I told you so? We should have wore our masks and hazmat suits. Mm -hmm. What a failure. In it, all of that is not helpful. It's hurtful. So the yeah. attitude of choosing to love, choosing mm -hmm. to have a lot of grace, to admit this is tough, and anyone in leadership right now knows how hard this is. So we tend to keep our mouth shut. Not all the time. We're not always perfect. But right now, we tend to be a little quieter and a little more temperate and reserved. Because, man, it is hard yeah. to make these decisions. So we need to choose to love and, and honestly be sharpened. I'll say one more thing. Be sharpened by different opinions. You know, if you're more cautious and I'm optimistic, I want to be sharpened by that. God's put you in my life to be cautious and so I can think more sensitively. Or if you're more optimistic and I'm more cautious, I can think, you know, John's really encouraging me forward here and I'm helping you to see things from different angles. So if we embrace one another, different gifts, surprise, 1 Corinthians 12, we're a body. If we embrace one another in the differences, we can actually grow a lot more from it. 
Absolutely. And so anything else you want to say to the people of Redeemer this time? Yeah, just in, in that vein of thought, uh, please, selfishly, I say this, please pray for us as your pastors. Um, in fact, Charles Spurgeon one time got really mad at a group of people because the sermon fell flat and things weren't happening. And he said, you, you didn't pray this time. He had a prayer team. And it was like the prayer team's fault. Imagine you preach a terrible <laughs> sermon and it's the prayer team's fault. That's how much he depended on prayer. It's how much we depend on prayer. Please pray for us. Pray for John. I mean, we're, this is plurality, but he is the lead pastor. He's got to go in the cave and figure things out. Pray for Kyle on the front lines with care ministry. and everything. Pray for Dale. He's balancing budgets and trying to forecast and, and shepherd staff. And would you please pray for me as I kind of just go, when do I get to gather with this or gather with that? And we got to make tough decisions. So pray for us, please. It's yeah. difficult to make decisions. It's not easy. And either way, some of you are going to be mad at us. Just know we love you. We're yeah. not trying to keep people from gathering. We're also not trying to throw people into harm's way. And again, two polarizing thoughts. We aren't just rolling over on government and yeah. thinking who cares about gathering. We're also not trying to be ground zero for any type of outbreak because we're too cavalier. It's a tough spot to be in. We love and appreciate you and would covet, please, your prayers as we wait to regather. Awesome. Thank you. Love you, brother. Thankful for you. Very helpful. So I wanted to make sure that we, we heard that word from Costi because as I conclude now, I've got something for everybody watching to dislike. And so this behind me is our plan to regather Redeemer Bible Church. It's going to roll out in three phases, and uh, it's going to take us into the fall. And what you need to hear before I get into the details is all of this is for now, meaning it can change as circumstances change. All of this is set firmly in pencil, all right? So take a look at phase one. Phase one is exactly the same as it is now. Online services at 5 p.m. and Saturdays at 9 a.m. Saturdays at 5 p.m., Sundays at 9 a.m. No kids ministry, no next gen ministry, no uh, 55 and over ministry. Both Costi and Pastor Daryl are committed to continuing online content during phase one. And so continue to meet online there. That's Thursday night for the gathering. That is Tuesday afternoon and evening for uh, Pastor Daryl's ministry. The big change, if you haven't done so already, comes to the growth groups. We encourage growth groups, we we did months ago, we encouraged you to connect through Zoom. I know it's clunky, but many of you fought through that, and that's great. You've stayed connected. As, as Kyle was saying, the one another's have been taking place, not just in growth groups, but beyond that. And, and that, that was the goal. The goal, but, but now that restrictions are lifting, get together. Get together to pray, get together to study the Bible, get your growth groups together, have watch parties on Saturday nights and and have a barbecue or Sunday morning and and have breakfast together. Begin, if you haven't done so already, to meet together. But also keep Zoom going for those who are still cautious about meeting. Keep it going until everyone in your group is comfortable with meeting again. Or Take a break from meeting because that's what would happen now that summer is upon us. We would encourage all the groups to take a break during this time anyway in the months of uh, June, July, and, and August. And so you, you have the freedom to do as you like. You can continue to meet on Zoom only, meet together, uh, meet half and half, or uh, cancel your group until, until the fall. Also, he, here's the point. Content and care was how we pivoted as a staff, and it's how all of us should live as the restrictions are are lifting. Biblical content and caring for each other. No virus can close the church because the church is a movement of people who are helping other people come to know, love, and serve Jesus. And that's going to happen regardless. And so I, I hope that that's happening. If it hasn't happened already, get it started again with your growth groups. Now, phase two is where we're going to change a little more. Starting the weekend of June 6th and 7th, we will be back to meeting in person at Redeemer Bible Church. I say the weekend because when we return, we're going to return with a Saturday evening service at 5 p.m. We're also going to have two Sunday services at 9 a.m. and 1045 to start. We will celebrate the Lord's Supper communion together that weekend. 
We've live streamed before the pandemic and we will continue to live stream indefinitely. Like Target or Walmart or dozens of other stores, Redeemer has a physical location and it has an online presence and both of those are going to continue. There there are a handful of people who don't want to return for a while and that's okay. We love you. We're here for you. We're gonna keep broadcasting. We are here to care for you. So just help us with that. If that's you, just help us with that by checking in with us every once in a while. Info at RedeemerAZ.org. Just just let us know how you're doing. Kids ministry will not be making a return at this time. Can you imagine trying to get kids to social distance? Can you imagine a kid coming into their classroom only to see adults in masks and gloves? They would think they're getting a shot or a root canal. Like that's what we, we don't want that for our kids. That is the last thing we want our kids to think about when they come to church. They're never going to want to come back. So we're, we're not going to start, we're not going to restart kids ministry at that time. Your kids can sit with you in the service if you want. And by offering identical services on Saturday and Sunday, one parent can come on Saturday and the other parent can come on Sunday if you want to do that. We will have a, the mom's room will be open so that any mom who wants to can use it. Again, Costi and Pastor Daryl will continue their studies through this time in 1 John and the Sermon on the Mount respectively. So join them online through the summer. That's not going to end. Growth groups, keep meeting or take your break during the summer. And in case you're wondering, men, women's marriage, you would be on a break during the summer anyway. And so those things will not be meeting, even though they haven't been meeting online either. So when it comes to our services that start the weekend of June 6th and 7th, we're going to trust you with a handful of things. First, we will trust you not to come if you're sick or if you've been sick in the past two weeks or if someone in your home has been sick in the past two weeks. We're going to trust you not to come. Second, We will trust you to make the best decision for yourself if you're over 65, if you have a pre-existing condition, or if you are in a high-risk category. We are leaving that to you. We trust you to make the right decision. Third, we trust you to spread out as much as possible in the service that you attend. We're not going to be walking around with, with, with rulers making sure that there's a correct distance between everybody. We're going to trust you to separate and sit where you should sit as you feel comfortable in a room full of people. Fourth, we will leave it up to you about wearing a mask. Now listen, if you don't wear one, we will expect you to love those who do. If you do wear one, We will expect you to love those who don't. Christians have the freedom to live according to their conscience. So let's make sure we are respecting the freedom that all of us have to live according to our conscience. All right. If if, if that's going to be too hard for you to do, then please continue to join us online. Five, we will leave it up to you as to if you are going to sing and how you greet people. Listen, we're going to respect each other, but we're also not going to police hugs and handshakes and fist bumps and conversations. Church just isn't church without singing. Church just isn't church without welcoming and being welcoming to people. And so we're not going to move around as the staff and make sure, hey, hey, don't, don't shake hands. We're not going to do any of that. We're going to leave that to you. Sixth, no donuts or drinks until we figure out how to do that with minimal contact or, or, we, or it's just we, we all feel comfortable with it again. And then finally, number seven, we will do our best to keep the, the campus clean and disinfected, especially the high traffic areas around the campus. Now, phase three only affects kids ministry, the gathering and our 55 and over ministry. Kids ministry and the gathering will probably start meeting again. And I say probably because what we're going to do is we're going to see what the schools are doing in our community and hear the arguments that they're giving for why they're doing it and go from there. So if they plan on everything proceeding as normal when school starts up again in the fall, then we will probably do the same thing. 
If there are significant concerns that, that, we, that they have that we don't share, then maybe we'll do something different. Maybe if, if they don't meet again, then we won't meet again. I, I, we're, we're, we're not making any promises here, but what I can tell you, what I can promise you is this, we're going to do what we believe is best for our kiddos. And I say our kiddos because we, we all have kiddos in the ministry, in the kids' ministry, in the gathering. So we don't want anybody's kids, let alone our own kids, to be in a place that's going to be dangerous for them. And so just know that. At the same time, the same thing is true for our 55 and overcrowd. If everything is back to normal, then we will start in-person meetings for our 55 and overcrowd on Tuesdays at 12 noon and on Tuesdays at 6 p.m. We, we, as Dale said, we, we love that group of people. We, we love you if you are in that group of people. So much so that we, we didn't just get any pastor for you. We got the best possible pastor I could think of for you. And during a time that you've said, hey, be isolated, don't be around people. We're saying, look, we, we care for you so much. We're getting you a specific pastor who is going to care for you and love you and teach you and shepherd you because we love you. And so just know that at that time, if it's, if it's, if it's good and right for in-person gatherings to meet, then we're going to do that with kids, with the gathering and with our 55 and over ministry as well. And so if you're looking at that and wondering again about men's and women's and marriage, same thing is true for them. If at that time everything's going in that direction, then we will do in person and we will probably do have an online component for those things too. And so this is, again, this is all very solidly written in pencil. But for now, phase one and phase two, this is what we're going to proceed with. And phase three, this is how we're going to proceed. We'll keep you posted on, on any changes if there are any. But we just want you to know this is where we're going. This is what we believe is God's will for our church at this time. Now, like I said, I'm sure there's something in, in, that, in that chart for everybody to dislike. So it's something for all of us to be mature Christian adults about. And follow the commands to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. To consider others as more important than, than, than my opinion, than, than my desires, than what I think should happen. Seriously though, no one loves the church more than pastors love the church. We, we miss you. We miss seeing you with our eyes. Online, the hashtag RedeemerAZ Live is great. But, but we miss seeing you with our eyes. We, we miss catching up and talking to you and, and giving you a hug and shaking your hand and asking how you're doing and, and seeing your face. We miss that. We hate being apart. And we, and we really look forward to being with you again. And as pastors, we, we don't get the luxury of just thinking about ourselves and, and our own families when it comes to thinking about regathering. We have to think about all of you all of the people that God has entrusted to our care to shepherd. And that's not as easy as it might seem, as Costi was saying. We have a big group of people watching right now who want to regather as soon as possible without any social distancing restrictions. And we have a group that is just as big that will not regather unless there are some kind of social distancing restrictions. And then we have another group at our church that is just that just doesn't know what they're going to do or they're, or they're like, Hey, we'll see you next year. You're, you're, we're not, you're not, you might not even see us then. This plan to regather is not detailed as others as I've seen. And it definitely puts a lot of responsibility where it belongs on you. We are trusting you. We're putting the responsibility in your hands to choose to do what you think is God's will for you and your family as well as all of the people that you're going to interact with here. We've thought, we've prayed, we've talked, we've thought some more, we prayed some more, we talked some more, we read articles, we watched videos, we talked to people in our community, we talked to other pastors, we talked to our insurance company, like we've retained legal counsel and all of this was tr to try to figure out what would be God's will to care for you during this time. All of this was done out of love for you. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your trust. As Costi said, please, please keep praying for us. Let's choose to trust. Let's love each other through this pandemic, which by the way, will pass. This pandemic will pass, but, 
But what's not going to pass is the movement of people that Jesus started that exists to help other people know him and love him and serve him. No virus can stop that. No virus has stopped that here at Redeemer. And it's not going to stop that because Jesus is, exists in his church. He's building his church, a pandemic and not even the gates of hell can stop it. And so just know, we believe with all of our hearts, this is the will of our senior pastor. This is the will of Jesus. We're seeking to follow his will for our church. And this is what we believe it is. And so I hope you understand that. I hope you enjoy that. I hope you embrace that and that you encourage others to do the same. Join me in prayer as we close. Father, I prayed for your blessing, your help to convey your will for our church. And I believe with all my heart that you've answered that prayer. Please, Father, use, use the things that we've talked about to help your people to convict where that's needed, to encourage where that's needed, to support and bless where that's needed. Like Costi said, we're, we're, just, we're just men trying to do your will, sinful men trying to follow you, our perfect savior. And so I pray that this helps do that. And I pray that you would continue to help us as we seek to see as many people as possible in our community and as you've opened doors, even around the world, help to know you and love you and serve you. Do this, please, I pray, Jesus, for the glory of your name. Amen.